Let's open with a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, what a beautiful day it is today. The warm weather that you gave us yesterday was just such a, such a breath of fresh air, Lord. Just a constant reminder of your care and your goodness to us, Lord. Giving us so many wonderful things that we don't deserve at all, Lord. All we are are sinners, destined for one destination away from you. And yet you stooped down out of love and sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, may we today show our love to you with our songs, with our hearts as we open them up to you and our ears as we listen to your message from your messenger. May we glorify you with our whole bodies, Lord. And may we be more determined to glorify you with our lives to show you our love of you through our actions, not just through our words. Lord, may everything that is done today glorify you and please you. In your name I pray, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Thank you for bearing with us with the audio on the live stream. I know we're working on some issues trying to get rid of the ringing, so each week we're trying to, try, trying to do something different to get that taken care of, but I really do appreciate uh, bear, you guys bearing with us, with us trying to figure out the audio. I do want to welcome you to our service here at Faith Baptist Church. If this is your first time joining us here in the building or online, thank you so much for being here with us and choosing to worship uh, with us this morning or evening, depending on when it is that you are watching this service. Just a huge thank you, and we hope today you will draw closer to the Lord um, through worshiping uh, Him today with us. Now, there are a couple announcements that I would like to take care of. As you know, there is a huge, I shouldn't, I, was, I guess you'd call it technically as a holiday. I hate using the term holiday, but that is what it is. Um, we have Easter coming up. And uh, as we know, Easter is a huge celebration as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. And with that said, we are going to do something special. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is for, we are going to have a Good Friday service here in the building at 2 o'clock p.m. So there will be more details sent out, but there will be a Good Friday service on Good Friday at 2 o'clock p.m. So we hope you are able to join us. There will be more details sent out about um, how you're going to let us know you're coming or whatever so we can properly accommodate you, uh, so you can join us or whether it will be live stream, however it is that you would like to join us. But there will be more details sent out with that. And also, the Easter service, uh, the resurrection service on Sunday, we are going to do something special. Pastor has been working. He's, he's put a couple ideas that I've heard, and they all sound pretty exciting. So there is going to be something really special, something you aren't going to want to miss out on. But there will be, we're working on the details, trying to figure out how to coordinate everything. And so uh, there will be more details sent out probably next week. On Sunday, we'll give you more details about how that is going to all work out, but do stay tuned, and there will be something 
special plan for um, Easter service on Sunday. So please stay tuned, and there will be more details coming up. So uh, with that said, that does finish all my announcements. Brother Paul's going to come with our next song, and then pastors are going to come with a message. Let's turn to hymn number 393. Number 393. Take my life and let it be. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing It is cold season. Colds are starting to go around. And uh, one of my kids got a stuffy nose yesterday, and so I've been extremely careful. My wife isn't here. She's home with the kids. Thankfully, no fevers. Um, the one kid is the only one that has any sign or symptoms, but we're just being extremely careful. And I hope you are, too, if for any other reason, because we have folks that do work and earn a living for their families, and if they get a stuffy nose or anything like that, they're not able to work. So we're just trying to be thoughtful of everybody else, but uh, it's a good reminder. With everything else the church family has gone through, car accidents and other things, that everyone is so focused on COVID-19. Isn't it good to know that God doesn't get distracted, that he continues to take care of us with all the other things that we don't ever normally worry about? For me, this has become a season of praise, and I'm thankful. All right, today is the third message on I Must. If you would please grab your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We even had to trim the service down a little bit with some of the music we were going to be doing, a special number that I was really looking forward to that we're going to reschedule. Uh, I know Pastor Matt talked a little bit about Easter. Just wanted to kind of fill you in. We have some ideas and we need to just stay diligent and try and make sure that it would all work out before we get you all excited with the idea that I've got cooking right now. But I think it could be very, very special. Either way, the service itself will be wonderful. And so I hope you'll come ready to celebrate resurrection in two weeks. It was funny. I was uh, working on a ministry trip with a ministry partner and had made all of these plans. We had booked flights and everything for this really quick trip to head over to uh, Bible college, and it was all on Easter. Guys, always check with your wives, always. 
I had gotten all these plans together. I'm the master of my calendar. And I told my wife, I said, well, I'm all set for that trip on the 4th. And she said, the 4th, what? She said, I thought you said it was next Sunday. I was like, yeah. She goes, that's not next Sunday. I was like, what? She goes, the 4th is Easter, pastor. It's like, oh, no. So we had to reschedule a bunch of things and clear our Easter schedule. I hope that you'll be excited about the resurrection. It's going to be special this year. Ephesians chapter 4, I must. With your Bible open to Ephesians 4, which is going to be the text we're focusing on, look at chapter 5, verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Let's work backward. Are the days evil? Okay, so if the days are evil, let's work backward. Redeem the time. Well, how do we redeem the time? Look at verse 15 one more time. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. What a really great wrap-up for the book of Ephesians. Pay attention to everything that I said, knowing that the days are evil. Oh, if only the Apostle Paul were able to live 2,000 years and see what we're dealing with now with technology and a global world like has never been seen before. Some of the odd and weird things that have been happening both with the European Union and with Israel even this last couple weeks and just a, a bizarre time, a time when you say the rapture's got to happen at any second. Well then see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. The first car that I ever owned, and some of you that have, I've pastored long enough already know this, was my great-grandmother's 1968 Ford Fairlane. When it was given to me by my grandfather, it had about 20,000 miles on it. It had sat in the garage most of its life, and I got it when it was over 30 years old. So the first time that it broke down on me, I automatically assumed that it was the most important components of the car. It had to be the engine or the transmission. And I remember being a couple miles from my parents' place. And it was before cell phones, so it was the long walk up and down driveways out in the country until someone was home. And the first family that was home invited me in so I could call my dad. And I told my dad the car broke down, something's wrong. When he got there, he said, what happened? I said, it started to just shake and chug and then die. Dad, I think it's done. And I'd only had the car for a few months. And he said, okay, well, let, what did you look at? I was like, I checked the battery connections, and I checked the box on the top, the air filter. And he's like, what else did you do? I was like, well, I checked the spark plugs, and I, I looked at this, and I looked at that. He goes, okay, good. So he goes to the front of the car. Then he climbs inside as though the engine is in the driving compartment. Turns on the key. He goes, well, found your problem. I'm like, Dad, how could you have found the problem already? He said, son, you ran it out of gas. You can be worried about everything stressful and overwhelming, but if you don't have the fundamentals of the Christian life, you're going to have a lot of problems in these days. Because these aren't normal days. These are dark days. And so if you're confused about the fundamentals of taking one step at a time, in the dark, you're going to trip and fall. And so walk circumspectly, not as close, but as wise. So we go back one chapter to see what some of these fundamentals are. Chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. How easy it is for a child of God Saved for years to look more like the lost than the saved. That's what he's saying. That should dig in. I'm thankful for the rich history of salvation in our church that goes decades beyond our own existence. But know this, just because you've been saved for a long time or your parents were saved, or your grandparents, or your great-grandparents, doesn't automatically mean that you are walking with the image of Christ. It's a good question. Do you look more like a saint, or more like the heathen? 
Well, he gives us some steps to ensure that we look like saints. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is one of those words that you're like, I probably don't know what it is, but I know what it sounds like. And it sounds like exactly what it is. To work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus that you put off, concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This is the three-part series that we've been looking at. I must. You cannot walk with God without discipline. There are ministries that have tried to create an environment that makes worship and walking with God so easy that there's no role for discipline. And what happens? No one grows. How much discipline did it take for Jesus to die on the cross? The Bible tells us that the stress to get on the cross was so heavy that he was sweating drops of blood. And maybe you've heard people talk about that passage and say he was sweating and it was as though it was drops of blood. No. Human beings can be under so much stress that our blood vessels will rupture. And those blood vessels that'll rupture on the surface of the skin are right next to the pores that release sweat. And so Jesus literally had sweat and blood mingled coming off of his brow. That's how hard it was for him to get to the cross. How much discipline did it take to not throttle? That's the word we use. My dad used to use that. It means like that, throttle. How much discipline did it take for Jesus not to throttle his disciples when they said some of the stuff that they said? Or to not prove that he was creator of the universe and put those foolish Pharisees right in their place. Salvation can't be earned, but if it wasn't for the discipline of Christ, we'd have no hope at all. And so expect discipline to be a part of your walk with Christ. Put off, put on. He gives you some examples. Verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of, the, one of another. Be you angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that you may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. For three weeks we have been studying discipline. Let me ask you a question. How much time have you invested in your personal life identifying those components that don't belong? I'm not just filling 40 minutes on Sunday. God has 40 minutes, one time a week, to transform who you are. And that's where we're at right now. Two sessions if you get online and check out the second service. At a time when the world is getting darker, you should be working harder. And yet how much time, for those that have been with this series, did you actually invest in trying to identify what's in your life that shouldn't be there? You say, well, there isn't anything. I'm perfect. Go back, listen to the last one. Now, I'm excited about today's message. And I say this quite frequently. That it's one of the most important messages I've ever preached, or the most important. But every once in a while, I'll preach a sermon that's so close to my heart that there's no other way to explain it than to say that it's taken a lifelong relationship with God and studying of his word to be able to share with you what God has laid on my heart today. Because I can't identify in every single person's life what problem you have. You'd be terrified and embarrassed. You'd be wrecked and destroyed. And worst of all, I'd probably miss the big things that are there because I have no idea where you're at. I can only guess what your problems are. I can't tell you how many times I've preached a message and had the person I didn't expect walk up to me and bring out a point in the sermon I didn't mean to make. 
And so I could try and fix you today. Or I can show you the principles found in God's word. How do you replace that which doesn't belong? And so from my life, let me give you three of the largest things God has taught me about shedding away the old man and becoming a new man. I was reading the story of a gentleman who was born in the late 1800s. He died in 1850s, or in the 1850s. And he will be known for all of history. He has a Wikipedia page. His first name was Carl, and his nickname was Count Carl. Because he worked in the medical field and got infatuated with a girl that got tuberculosis and died. And after they buried her, he was so infatuated with her, he went and stole the body from the cemetery, brought it home, and lived with that body for nearly a decade. As the body fell apart, he would tie it back together with wire and plaster of Paris. When they found out what Count Carl had been doing, they wanted to put him in prison for it. But the problem was that in his state, the statute of limitations on any given crime was five years. And it's not a crime to live with a dead corpse. It is a crime to steal a dead corpse without permission. And so they wanted to try him for stealing the corpse, and they couldn't because it had been too long. I won't go into the details, but needless to say, that's gross. Do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that those that live in sin are dead in sin. And that when we are made new in Christ, all death has passed from us, spiritually speaking. And what the Apostle Paul is saying versus the old man and the new man is to live with the living Christ, not live with the dead corpse that once was your past. I've spent time living with corpses in my life. Hanging on to that which doesn't belong as a child of God. So if you're wondering what the process is, the put off, put on, they're called resolutions. You determine what shouldn't be, and then you create a resolution. It's not going to be that way anymore. And so I'd like to walk you through scripture and show you three resolutions as examples because at the end of it, I can't do this for you. You have to get in the word of God. You need to start begging the spirit. You need to start identifying, and you need to become a godly person. But let me give you some fundamentals today. Three resolutions that will help us discipline ourselves. I must. Resolution number one. Go to Proverbs chapter four. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this. If you don't have it memorized, this is one you should jot down somewhere and memorize it. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Here's another way for us to understand this. And this really is kind of the, this is the heart of our ministry. Win the heart. Walk with God where no one else sees. Bore down. Be authentic. Your heart matters. Win the heart, win the body. Win the body, lose the heart, lose the body. Another way to say it is this. If you don't have a reason for what you do, you listen to me. Parents, listen. If your children don't have a reason for what they do, you can teach them what they ought to be doing, and they will not do it. I wrote a sermon one time that I never preached called The Mighty Misuses of the Book of Proverbs. And in there, because sometimes we'll use verses and passages, 
And in the book of Proverbs, we're told, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we've used that passage to say, I told my kid everything they were supposed to be doing. And then in the end, they didn't do it. But here's my question. Did you tell them why? Because if you don't win their heart, you will lose their body. Because Proverbs 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That is to say, teach your child's heart. And your child's heart will keep those things when they're old. Your heart matters. And one of the most important questions we can ask is why? Why did I do that? Why do I do those things? Why did he just say that? Why did she just do that? Resolution number one. Because it's good to go boring down. And you ask why? Parents, have you ever done this? Your kid just disrespects you in ways that would humiliate you in front of any other person. And you know they just did it. And you look at each other and you say, well, he was tired. Have you ever done that before? Well, he's tired. Here's resolution number one. If you can't memorize it, write it down. Because this is something that you should live by. Resolution number one in my life, as one that wants to walk with God, number one, my explanations will never be my excuses. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. There is a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. But you listen. That reason for doing wrong is never more powerful than the reason to do right. That is to say, whatever my experience, opinion, or explanation cannot overpower the fact that God made all things and deserves certain expectations. Right is always right. We are good at making excuses. Maybe you've dealt with sin in your life, and you struggled and wrestled with it. And then you found out that that sin was in your parents' life. And then you found out that that same sin that was in your parents' life was also in your great-grandparents' life and your grandparents' life. It's always been in everyone's life. It's like the prisoner finding out that his grandfather was a prisoner. Oh, well, then it wasn't really my fault. Because it's in the blood. Now, is that a reasonable explanation? That is to say, if my great-grandfather had a problem with honesty, my grandfather had a problem with honesty, my father had a problem with honesty, and all my brothers had a problem with honesty, then couldn't we pretty much so make the assumption that I would have a problem with honesty? It's still wrong to be dishonest. It only explains, it helps you understand what's going on. One of the greatest ways to figure out what it is that God should be working on you in is to look at your environment and those that have affected you most. If you've got a parent that has a glaring sin in their life, look at yourself. It's not an excuse. It'll only show you what ought to be. It's an explanation. So we go back to the illustration. Lucas is tired. He just mouthed off to his mother. Lucas mouths off, Lucas gets consequences, plain and simple. We were telling him when we were kids, they used to do the old soap in the mouth. Did you ever get that when you were a kid? Said something you shouldn't, soap in the mouth? I searched scripture and I couldn't find it anywhere in scripture, but it talks about the proper way to discipline a child. So I stick with what scripture said, the proper way to discipline a child. So I was telling Lucas, he had mouthed off one day. I said, Lucas, that's consequences, buddy. I said, you know, when I was a kid, I'd get soap in my mouth. He goes, well, then can I have soap in my mouth? I said, no, you get consequences. I said, buddy, you don't want soap in your mouth. And he said, yeah, I do. I said, buddy, you do not want soap in your mouth. Yeah, I do. The reason why you think you want it is because you've never had it. Trust me, you don't. And I've read the Bible. It doesn't say anything about soap in the mouth. It does say consequences are the best way to raise a child. And so consequences are what ye shall get. Okay, Daddy. Now, I could have looked at my wife. Parents, 
If you're having fun spanking your children, stop. You do not have the love of Christ in you. Sometimes parents will get together and start talking about paddling and all that stuff and start bragging about their paddles because it's all a joke. And yet you know when you go to spank your child or give your child consequences that it is one of the most heart-wrenching things you'll ever do. And it's really easy to turn to the other spouse and say, well, you know this and this and this, and so I'm not going to give them these consequences. Don't ever let explanations be excuses as a parent. Ever. As hard as it is to give those consequences. There's no excuse for doing wrong. By the way, we've been doing it since the garden. Do you remember when God came to Adam and said, what did you do? Well, it really wasn't my fault. It was the woman's fault. There's nothing wrong with an explanation. There is everything wrong with an excuse. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. I'm going to show you this verse. While you're turning to Proverbs 24, uh, the house that we grew up in, we had a landline. I know it sounds insane, but we did. We had a landline, had the signal in the whole nine yards. And the town that we grew up in ran out of four-digit numbers. That's how small our town was. It took a while, but eventually they ran out of four-digit numbers. Now, I'm not a math guy, but I've, I've got some math people here. How many phone numbers does it take to run out of four-digit phone numbers? Is it like 9,999, right? That's, the town was over 10,000. And so in preparation for running out of numbers, the first three numbers, not the area code, but the next three numbers in the town that I grew up in, I'll even give you our old phone number because I remember it. I don't know why, but I do. It was 414-673-6514-673. And we were running out of the last four digit numbers in town, so they added 670. And unfortunately, one of the larger factories in town got the number 6706514. And we were 6736514. And it was the only number. So these guys would call. And for decades, everyone in Hartford called 673 and then whatever four numbers. You did it without thinking about it. My fingers to this day will do it. 673, 673. You know, over, down, up. And so these guys, 670 was hard to do. So we would get calls all the time for Triton International Trailers. And it, was, it would come at the worst times, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, ring, ring, ring. No answer. Ring, ring, ring. No answer. We didn't have an answering machine. In those days, you couldn't afford one. They were expensive. So we didn't have one. I remember when we got one, and we had to put the tape in and close the lid. And Dad had to record the message, and we all stood around Dad while he recorded the message. You guys remember those days? They were big days. So they call it wooden actor. They tried it. Finally, my dad would get up. The whole house would be awake. Four in the morning. He'd answer the phone. This isn't Triton. You need 670. You dialed 673, and then you go back to bed. This happened for years. I can tell you how often people would dial 670 because they were calling in sick. You'd be shocked at how often people didn't want to work. And we'd hear every excuse you could imagine. People would call in, oh, my dog is sick, and I'm not going to be able to make it into work today. My dad one time was so frustrated with getting those calls, he said, one of these times I'm going to answer the phone and say, don't bother coming in and hang up. Excuses, right? Look at what Proverbs, uh, Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 24. Verse 16 stands alone on its own. For a just man falleth seven times, and he riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Probably one of the worst excuses that we will use is that there's no such thing as victory. That is such a lie, and it's such an excuse. How many times does Solomon say a righteous man will get up off of the same mistake? One guy got it. How many times does Solomon say the righteous will, will stand back up again? Seven times. Hannah, how many times 
does Solomon say the righteous will stand up again? Brother Ray, how many times does Solomon say the righteous will stand up again? Seven times. Brother Ed, sit back to managing the video for us today. How many times does Solomon say the righteous will get back up again? You guys got it? How many? Don't forget it. It doesn't matter how many times I've done it. I'm not going to do it anymore. Because my explanations will not be my excuses. Oh, sure, I've got this habitual sin. It explains a lot in my life. But a habitual sin is never excused, ever. My explanations will not be my excuses. Why? Because rationalization is the birthplace of corruption. The moment I rationalize something, I can expect to have no integrity in my life. You can plan on being corrupt if you want to start justifying things. It's called being a politician. That's why the rules, as frustrating as it is, don't seem to apply to everybody anymore. Because if I can rationalize it away, or rationalize that what they're doing is wrong, then we can get popular opinion to turn on one person for one failure and forgive the other for the exact same thing. Why? Because it's not what actually matters. Other things matter. And we are rationalizing righteousness. No, right is always right, and wrong is always wrong. And there's no explanation that changes that, ever. So here's a question. What about if the reason that I am what I am isn't because of what I did, but because someone else did it to me? Go to Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> and I will show you our second resolution. I'll say this, if because you're probably listening to this, it's a sermon. But if you will listen to this as the sermon, these three resolutions will change your life. You'll catch up. Let me see. I was, I was saved when I was seven. I'm 38. So that's 31 years of salvation. If you will write these down and live them for the next several weeks, you'll catch up on 31 years of walking with God for me in a moment. Because it took 31 years of failing to understand what God was trying to teach me with these three resolutions. And anyone that's been saved for a long time can connect with these. For one, my explanations will never be my excuses, ever. I will do what's right. Will you? Resolution number two. Moving away from my failures to the failures of others. I find another life-changing resolution. In verses 15 through 20, Jesus describes the process when someone hurts you, how you're supposed to forgive them. How that all works. How the offending party bears the responsibility. Look, if you're confused about reconciliation, on your own, study Matthew 18, 15 through 20. Because he gives you the process. And I'll tell you this, the counsel that the creator gives isn't to just pretend like it didn't happen. That never helps. That's not healthy. Address it. And if you're not sure how to address it, then write it down, put it in your notes, and plan on studying it this week. How do I address it when someone has hurt me? Matthew 18, 15 through 20. And we get to verse 21 after Jesus says, if somebody hurts you, forgive them. Go to them and make it right. This is what Peter asks in verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Now I've searched high and low to understand. Why did Peter say seven? Because uh, the common practice in Judaism was three times. And they got that from the book of Amos. If you go back and read the book of Amos, God says several different times in the book of Amos through the prophet, three times have you done this, yea, four, and I will forgive you no more. And then he says, this is what I plan on doing to you because you didn't, you didn't do what was right. 
four times. Three times, forgive you, fourth, no, nope, not happening. And so God said that in the book of Amos. And so Judaism said, see, we only have to forgive three times. So in other words, if your spouse lies to you three times, the fourth time, you can give them the boot. That customer stole from you three times, the fourth time, take off their hands. It, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do after they've done wrong, you get to do it because you already forgave them enough times. So here's a question. Where does Peter get the seven? Well, we're not told. But I know what we read in the book of Proverbs chapter 24, that the righteous rise seven times. And so Peter doesn't go to the common practice of the day, which the Pharisees were doing. Instead, it's almost like acknowledging that a righteous man rises seven times, and you can forgive the righteous, but the godless that don't want to do what's right, they'll do something wrong at the time, and then I don't have to forgive them, right? Lord, what's the number? Because we know the Pharisees said that, and it's in the book of Amos, but Proverbs says the righteous man rises seven times. How many times should I forgive that? Jesus says in verse 22, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. And of course, you know the idea is not counting. Just start forgiving. What's the worst thing anyone has ever done to you? Think for a second. What is the worst thing that someone has ever done to you? You say, I don't want to go there. Pastor, don't, don't, I don't want to go there. But for a moment, under the gentle guiding of the Holy Spirit, let God take you back to that place, but for a moment. And let's ask the question, are you able to forgive? Not seven times, but 70 times seven. Say, I, I don't know that I can. Let me show you what your standing is with God if you're one of God's children. Go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 14. If this isn't one of your favorite passages in the Bible, something's wrong with you. <laughs> You'll see. It's awesome. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, if you stop at verse 14 and look at me, here's a question. And Lucas asks lots of really great questions about heaven all the time. And he asks, are there animals in heaven? And I thought long and hard about it. And I've decided that there must be. For a couple different reasons. But the biggest being God created them. And when he made all these things, he said, they're good. It's good. It was supposed to be a part of the created order. And so my expectation is that in the new heaven and the new earth, he will make all things new. Maybe we'll even see creatures we've never seen before. But scripture actually talks about angels being in the image of animals. I think in our heads we have this carbon copy cutter image of what an angel is. That an angel is a glowing human being in a white robe with big white wings coming off of its back. And it glows a bunch and sometimes at Hallmark it has a halo on. But when you read the descriptions of angels, it is a created species with massive variation in it. We have angels that look like lions and angels that look like calves. We have angels that have the bodies of animals and the heads of humans. This is what creation looks like. And here's the question. When I take my spot in heaven, which spot do I get to take? And I always think about Isaiah chapter 6 and the four angels, the four creatures circling around the throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy. And then you read in Revelation chapter 4, 5, and 6 as the saints worship God. And I wonder, what role do I take 
Paul comes in Romans chapter 8 and tells me exactly what my spot is. It's in verse 15. You have not received the spirit of a, a bondage again to fear. You've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And anyone that has been close to someone that has adopted know what adoption means. But not everyone benefits from that. Not everyone knows what adoption is. Even when we were adopting, there were many people that we had to educate. One of the hardest questions that we ever heard was, how are you going to be able to love them like your own? Could you imagine me not being able to love Lucas like Brother Mike loves Josiah? That's his boy. He's my boy. I don't care where he came from. That's my boy. And so there's this spirit of adoption that only those that are close enough to it would know it. And so he goes on and he says, those that are a part of the spirit of the adoption that that it is in the world, and that it is to be a father or a mother adopting a son or a daughter knows this. That's my child. And so we can cry out to God, Abba, Father. Now remember in the Old Testament, the name of God was written in form so that it could not be spoken. But you and I can cry out, Abba, Father, because of Jesus. Did you know that we all say, no, it is in the Old Testament. God's name is Yahweh. No, it's not. It's Y-H-W-H. It's not supposed to be spoken. It's supposed to be known that God has a name that we're not worthy to speak of. And Paul comes slicing in and says, no, you've been adopted. You can cry out, Dad, Father, cry out and call him as though he's close to you and you to him. Familiarity, affection, worthiness. My kids can't understand why, when they're in the nursery, they're not allowed to go into my office. It's dad's office. It's fair game. No, it's not. That's the pastor's office. I've watched nursery workers chase after my children and catch them at the door and pull them back. Why? Because they have proximity with me that other children don't know. I've, I don't know that I've ever seen, maybe a couple of times, maybe, probably Joe Scally's kids would be my guess. No, I'm just kidding with you. The kids in the church that want to come in, they'll stop at the door, and they'll just stand there. At the doorway, they won't go in. They'll just stand there. Well, you guys, come on in. That's why I put chocolate in my office before the Rona. Boy, were those days nice. Before the Rona, I had chocolate in my office. The kids could come in and get it. That's why, because they were afraid to walk in, not my kids. And my kids will come in and just sit right on the seat. Why? Because I'm their daddy. That's what Abba Father means. Proximity that no one else could ever understand or appreciate. The spirit of adoption. And so you have this special relationship with God. That no one else in all creation, including the angels, don't get to have. And the only way to understand it is to understand the relationship that Jesus as God and God's Son had with the Father while he was on earth. In flesh form. Some of you dads actually understand this concept. We can't exhaust the nature of God, but when your child gets hurt, mom, your heart hurts. You would rather it have been your own flesh. It's as though the two of you are one. Well, with God, he actually is one. And he's inviting us into that relationship. It's more than we can comprehend. It's a closer than we ever have known. And so Paul goes on to describe this. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So you're listening to this and you're not saying, I think he's overstating it. I don't think I'm that close to God. You know that's what it meant when you asked God to save you. And now you know why, because the Spirit is in you telling you you're that close to God. Yes, yes, yes. Listen to the preacher. He's actually right right now. And you know it. So what does it mean if we're children of God? Well, verse 17, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, yes? Every child is an heir to the estate. But usually, in history, the eldest got the largest blessing, especially biblically speaking. The eldest got the largest blessing, and the rest only got a fraction. And so Paul goes on to say, no, 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 you don't get the leftovers. You're joint heirs with Christ. So in other words, everything Christ deserves, you deserve. 
Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 tells us what God has made Christ the heir of all things. Jesus tells us in John chapter 17 that you're going to inherit my glory. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are to inherit the riches of Christ. Glory, riches, honor, and everything. Join heirs of Christ. Go back to Matthew chapter 18. How many times should I forgive? In verse 23, hot on the heels of Peter's question, how many times should I forgive? Jesus says in verse 22, an unlimited number of times. He says this in verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And then when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. I don't even know what a talent is, but that sounds like a lot, right? But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. The Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and he took him by the throat, saying, pay me that thou owest. His fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not. But he went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. They came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And his Lord, that had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and he delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Number two, as an heir, I will not be a debt collector. As an heir of Christ, I will not be a debt collector. There is no room for bitterness in the heart of God's child, ever. Because there's no possible way, no matter what was done to you, could ever be as bad as what you did to Jesus on the cross. And people can do horrible things. But we tormented the sinless flesh of God with our corruption. In the hiding place, Corey Ten Boom writes this. It was a church in Munich where I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a gray overcoat, brown felt had clutched a uh, brown felt hat clutched between his hands. One moment I saw the overcoat, brown hat, and the next a blue uniform and a visor cap with its skull and crossbones. Memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man, I could see my sister's frail form ahead. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrück, uh, Ravensbrück in, your, in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. But since that time, he went on, I've become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I'd like to hear it from your lips as well. Fraulein, again the hand came out, will you forgive me? 
And I stood there and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition that we forgive those that have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Still, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart, but forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder and it raced down my arm. It sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands former guard and former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then in that moment. Corey Tennant, The Hiding Place. People have taken things from me in my life, but no one will ever be able to take away as much as God has given me when Jesus died for me. You can take away my dignity. You can take away my name. You can take away my reputation. You can take away my wealth. You can take away my ignorance. You can take away my family. But you cannot touch Christ in my life. Because I don't have him because I earned it. I have him because he forgave me. And I forgive you. I will not, as an heir, be a debt collector. The first two resolutions come heavy and hard, and they take a lot of time. And the last one is simple. Go to Psalm 119, and I'll give you the final resolution, and we'll be done. Let's go back to that whole excuses thing. According to a United Press news item, the Metropolitan Insurance Company receives some unusual explanations for accidents throughout the years. Here are just some of the following excuses from their policyholders. I picked the best ones. The other car collided with mine without warning me of its intention. As I reached an intersection, a hedge sprang up, obscuring my vision. If you don't laugh at this one, my heart will be broken. The pedestrian had no idea which direction to go, so I ran over him. Thank you. The telephone pole was approaching fast. I attempted to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. Real excuses. Here's the last one, and it's the best. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. Good night, you know. I tried hard, but I got him. There's lots of reasons why you're sloppy in your walk with Christ. But there is a single solution. And it's that we don't read and study the Bible on our own. Because it's God's greatest tool. Resolution number three. I don't know will not be my I don't care. I don't know will not be my I don't care. 
I'll explain myself in just a second, but look at Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Verse 89. I'm just going to give you three. By the way, Psalm 119 goes through the entire Hebrew alphabet talking about the importance of the Bible. And I'm giving you just a taste. Verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. You know what that means? The Bible was as good when it was written as it is today. Settled in heaven forever. You know, at one point in American history, they attached leeches to people to make them better because they thought if you suck the blood out of them, then they won't get sick and die. Aren't you glad that's not relevant information anymore? I hate leeches. I'd rather die. Did you know that I have never found anything in God's word that isn't relevant to my life ever? And to the message of the gospel? Written over a span of 5,000 years. 4,000 years, sorry. And it's as relevant today as it was when it was written. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. One more. Verse, 10, uh, verse number 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgment. This book is awesome. I was in court one time to address a traffic fine that I had incurred. I don't even remember what it was for, but I'm sure I deserved it. Whatever it was, I remember it wasn't speeding. Because as I sat there listening to people with their excuses for speeding, all I could think was, Man, am I glad I'm not sitting here because of speeding. There's just really no good excuse. My, my foot got numb and it got heavy and I didn't realize I was going that fast. There's like, there's just no, if they get you speeding, you're done. This young man steps up at varying degrees of appearing before a judge. Can I give you a little insider information? If you want the judge to look favorably on you, show him some respect in what you dress. This kid steps up in... in T-shirt, necklace on, jeans halfway down because it's just too hard to keep them up where they belong. A pair of tennis shoes and he stands in front of the judge like, I just don't care. Until the judge opened his mouth and he kind of straightened up like, oh man, he's doing the talking. It was like, all of a sudden this kid realized, I don't think I'm in charge here with my attitude. And the judge begins to ask him questions. Were you the operator of the vehicle? Uh, yeah, I was. Yes. Yes, I was. Thank you. Do you own that vehicle? Yeah, yes, yes. Thank you. Was anyone else in the car with you? Yeah, uh, yes, I had some friends in the back. Okay. And was it on this day to the best of your memory? Uh, yes, I believe it was. Then he turns to the police officer and says, is this the road that you were on? He goes, yes, it was. And he turns to the kid, he goes, now correct me if I'm wrong, isn't that a gravel road? Yeah, I mean, yes, it is. He said, what's the speed limit on that road? He goes, I don't know. He said, there isn't a, there isn't a speed limit sign, so there isn't a limit. And the judge says, well, it says here that you were doing 75. Now, I know this officer pretty well. He's a gracious guy. My guess is he was doing more than 75, wasn't he? And the officer said he was doing 79, sir. And I'm thinking, on a gravel road, are you nuts? And the kid said, but there wasn't, he interrupted, he was, but there wasn't a speed limit sign. And so there was this discussion with this kid. If it's unposted, there's still a speed limit in the state of Michigan. And he said, well, I didn't know that. Hey, catch this. This is what the judge said. And I'd never seen it in living motion until then. He said, ignorance is not a defense when it comes to the law. You can't stand in front of me and say, I don't know, and so I'm allowed to do it. Well, I didn't realize it was against the law to kill somebody. Oh, well, since you didn't know, don't do it again. And I'm thinking, who in their right mind would justify 75 miles an hour on a gravel road because there's no speed limit sign? Excuse me, 79. How foolish man will be with their excuses. 
simply stated the kid didn't care what speed it was. He didn't know and it didn't matter. And so it is that the believer lives, that as long as I don't know what the Bible says, I don't have to care what the Bible says. But these are evil days, and you can't afford to be ignorant. And so you know what you need to do? Study. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that it's more evil today than it was for your parents? I do. Do you think it's more evil for your parents than it was for your grandparents? I was talking to somebody in their 80s, and they said, I feel really bad for your generation. We grew up in the 50s, and it was the greatest time to be alive. I wish I could say that. I grew up in the 90s. It was horrendous. I couldn't imagine growing up in the 2010s, and I pray for the kids that have to grow up in the 2020s. You can't afford to not study this book. Get in it every day. My I don't know cannot be my I don't care. My I don't know will become my I better get into it. And let this become your resolution. Replace your complacency with urgency. Replace your bitterness with forgiveness. And you replace your excuses with righteousness. Shed off the dead corpse and walk as a new creature in Christ. Here are but three resolutions that will absolutely change your life. Father, as we go to prayer. Lord, I will, I will acknowledge that this concept of discipline is, is a lifelong pursuit. That if we'll dig into your word and study it, we'll be amazed at the blemishes that you will show us. That are in us that we didn't even see. But here are some obvious ones. And Father, I pray for your wisdom to saturate our will, our desire. But that we would know that following you... It's not a feeling. It is a commitment. And I pray that we would make that today. As we go into the invitation with heads bowed and eyes closed, how has God worked in your heart today? Let's work backward. Are you lazy when it comes to the Bible? I will tell you, you can't afford to be. Way too many people have opinions of the kingdom but don't read the Bible. If you don't read God's word, get rid of your opinion and start studying because you just don't know. And because you don't know, you have lived like you don't care. That's enough. You will answer for everything that is written in this book because you won't be able to stand in front of the master and say, well, I didn't have the book and I didn't have the resources. Every man will give an answer for the things that they have done. Get in the book. Tell God today you will. Apologize that you've neglected the greatest masterpiece of literature that's ever been written. God's love letter to you. I'm not telling you that if someone hurt you, that it was a small thing if they did it. Other people's sin can become atrocious, atrociously de destructive in our lives. But I will tell you this, God would have you forgive them, just as he has forgiven you. Because when we are bitter, we give power to that sin. But when we forgive, we show just how powerful the cross really is. Maybe there's someone you need to forgive today. And then finally, have you been making excuses? Stop. The righteous gets up seven times. And God will forgive you 70 times 7. I hope that you'll spend some time with him in prayer. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Let's stand to our feet. We'll give you a chance to respond. I'll pray for God to work in your life. And then we will move swiftly toward the end after you've gotten to spend the time that you need with the Lord. Father, as we move into the invitation, I pray that each decision that would be made would be a permanent one. That we wouldn't just simply feel our way through this, but that we would declare resolutions it would change the way that we're living. Sloppy isn't going to cut it when we are in this much danger. And so would you please guide us now during this invitation. If we can learn these three, Father, I know that you can teach us much, much more than I can preach on. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. As the piano begins to play, you make a choice where you're standing. Get down on your knees, come to the front, sit down where you are. If God's worked in your heart, would you talk to him about being a disciplined disciple of Jesus Christ? Father, thank you for the time that we have gotten to worship together. For the servants that are in the building and the ones that are watching online, unify us through the message and the gospel that Jesus died because he chose to love us and we walk with you because we choose to love you. Lord, I pray that you would convict us deeply in the areas where we are sloppy, in the areas, God, that you know that no one else does. Create an urgency and a discomfort in our heart that would demand a change. For Lord, you could return today. May you find us faithful in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your good attention today. You all listened very well. You put in a hard morning of work, and I have overran the time. And so it'd be a huge help to us. It's, it's my fault, but it'd be a huge help to us if you would help us by clearing the building somewhat quickly today. We can get ready for the next group that's coming in. I know that's not the way we normally do it, but thank you, and I'm going to go ahead and slip out right away. You are dismissed.